<laughs> well, this morning we're um, looking at the third of four segments of the Holy Cow Assessment Tool. And uh, this section is titled Goals and Aspirations, and uh, also ask what can we be doing now in this transition period. Um, the, uh, I, I guess I would say that uh, this week's reveals are uh, much more predictable than, than maybe what we saw last week in, in uh, Sydney's section. Um, I'm gonna start with the, the aspirations area. Um, the definition of aspiration is the thing desired, longed for, or hoped for. And um, out of the 107 uh, survey or assessment questions, uh, there were 16 that uh, were dealing with um, what the priorities of the church uh, might be. And questions 57, 58, and 59 um, were the ones that made up the first three aspirations. And, and out of uh, all of the respondents, all the different age groups of respondents, uh, everybody, the, every group had these three. And I don't think they come as any surprise. There are things that we hoped for, aspired to have. Uh, number one being make necessary changes to attract families and children and youth to our church. Um, easier said than done. Uh, particularly in light of uh, what Teresa shared with us last week that uh, uh, the younger people uh, tend to not be that interested. And uh, so there are, there's not a big pool, I suppose, to draw from. Uh, the, the second uh, aspiration was develop and implement a comprehensive strategy to reach new people and incorporate them into the life of the church. Again, that's what's the million dollar question is how, how do we go about doing that? And hopefully over the course of the next several months, uh, uh, we'll begin to explore that, starting with uh, conversations at the session level and, and then uh, reaching out to the congregation as a whole. Uh, the, uh, you know, we just, we can't expect our next uh, lead pastor to be able to bring those families to us. It's going to start with, with us. And those are conversations that, uh, that we'll need to have. The third one uh, was a little more surprising, uh, at least to me. That one is provide more opportunities for Christian education and spiritual formation at every age and stage of life. That um, so is surprising to me in that uh, we've, we've struggled in the last several years in uh, our adult ed uh, participation. I know we've had good people working on those and, and uh, there's probably been some frustration there. On the other hand, as Sydney mentioned uh, last week in, in uh, the assessment, uh, showed that uh, we, we, we are very interested in education generally and, and challenging uh, our thought process. And that goes back to the Hope Center days and, um, and more recently our, our summer solstice pro program. So uh, we, we are, I think, as a group, very interested in education. We just uh, uh, generally haven't shown up so much on the adult level. Uh, it's another area we need to work on. The, uh, the fourth uh, aspiration was develop ministries that work toward healing those broken by life circumstances. And I'm not sure how we would define that one. Uh, does that mean ministries locally or we're looking you know, at Guatemala or how do we identify those in need. Uh, 
Do we heal? Do we heal with uh, time and talents or financial gifts or all of the above? So again, the assessment um, was looking at where we would uh, like our additional energy to be placed to expand or improve our ministries. And these four uh, were the highest uh, rank, uh, saying that, yeah, we need, we need to put more energy, uh, a lot more energy in some cases. Uh, the three um, that we, we showed as goals were actually the next three that uh, got the highest ranking. Um, the first being deepen our sense of connection to God and one another, stronger worship services. And uh, to me, that, that speaks to the importance of, for us of our traditional worship, worship services uh, and connecting with God, but, but also the importance of community and worshiping together as family. The, uh, the second one is uh, strengthen the management and support of people in various ministries so that they are able to do what they do best in work that is meaningful and celebrated. Um, I don't know what, what you think that means. I'm not sure. Um, does that mean in-house or, or ministry yeah. beyond our doors? Uh, The third one, uh, younger families express the need for First Presbyterian Church to adapt the opportunities it provides by making them more accessible given the pace and schedule of their lives. Things like online learning, uh, early morning classes, lunchtime classes. Uh, that one, uh, as you would expect, was uh, priority of the uh, younger respondents, not so much uh, everybody across the board. The uh, areas where we could maybe be doing some things now, um, I, I listed a few things that, uh, that I think are in progress. Uh, one is uh, the preparations that we're making to go ahead and continue our uh, worship services online, even when we're able to get back to in-person worship, uh, just having that, those available, uh, we've strengthened that, I think, with uh, some equipment that we purchased, and uh, both on the the video and the sound side and uh, getting people trained to, to do that and just getting more comfortable with that. I think that allows us to reach people where they are and uh, I think that's something we, we plan to continue indefinitely. Uh, the stewardship campaign did ask the congregants uh, what they might be most comfortable in doing in terms of sharing their time and challenge. That's, that's a, a recent thing. The church has invested in some new software program that uh, as I understand that will enhance the ability for us to stay connected to our, to our family. Uh, things like prayer requests and letting people know, let, letting congregation members know when somebody uh, has an injury or isn't feeling well, provided those folks are are, are wanting to hear that. But just, uh, Keith and Ewan could probably speak more to that. Another thing that's that's happened in recent months is uh, the formation of the communications task force uh, formed to help assist Brittany uh, in keeping us all better connected uh, in these unusual times. Recently, the task force members um, reached out to church committees and are uh, seeking photos uh, 
with activities that are going on in the church that can, can put a face with the work being done. Those are some things that, that are, I think are happening. Uh, the deacons uh, have um, been working on expanding their outreach beyond uh, those FTC members that are at the manor or uh, kind of cut in uh, those like mobile, but uh, trying to reach out to just, just other members in the congregation during this time to kind of keep us connected. Um, I think the care portal is another example of uh, us attempting to reach out and uh, a new way of finding uh, those people who are broken in the need. Um, so I guess I'd open up discussion about ideas uh, that you all might might have. I, I thought last week, uh, for those that were on, again, uh, Teresa had uh, spoke to us a little bit about younger, younger people and families and the lack of opportunity uh, that seems to be there beyond the college years. Uh, her terms were things like church is messy. People have been hurt by the church, and I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to see what what examples she might have of, of that. Generally, just people not being interested, not looking for a church. So those are all part of the challenges that, that we face, I think, in reaching our aspirations of attracting younger families and um, you know, I think I can, can speak for uh, those of us in that older generation in that uh, um, youth just really light, light things up for, for all of us. And, and most grateful to see them uh, in worship and uh, in other activities around the community. And, um, and then the young, young families, want more young families there to uh, experience the things with them. So uh, I'll just kind of open it up and see uh, what questions any of you might might have from the information that's being presented. Randy, if I might ask a, a broader question of uh, those goals and aspirations that you went over, is there anyone that would disagree with any of those or uh, say that they're, we're missing something else in those goals or aspirations? No. So everybody's pretty much in agreement with. I think so. Well, I don't know if the education uh, part of the aspiration necessarily talks to the issue that we uncovered last week about spiritual development. Now, those two obviously can go hand in hand, but I do think we were particularly low compared to other churches in that area. And so either we need to make an aspiration perhaps more specific to that or add that idea of spiritual development in with the education goal. Um, and I think that's a good point, but that really surprised me because I thought that was an area where we really, I think, have done a pretty good job in the last several years. So having us say that about ourselves really did surprise me. Um, if you think back over the opportunities that we as a congregation have offered one another in group work, um, I'm surprised that we, I'm just surprised we rank so much lower than other churches. So obviously I am missing, <laughs> I'm missing something. As Randy was reading um, through those, and I, you know, I'm also I'm a, a visually um, 
you know, I require visuals um, to, to process information. So um, the first thought that struck me is um, these are reoccurring themes as we have done uh, congregational assessments and utilize tools like Holy Cow before, um, those aspirations have come up uh, yeah. continuously over 25 years, particularly that first one, this deep-seated desire to attract more young families. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and so why is that, that that doesn't feel like we have ever met that goal that we have been racing for um, for 25, 40 years. Um, and part of that is, or from my standpoint, I sometimes feel like um, we get in a habit of our tribal conversation um, because I do, it, before the pandemic and we went online, and now I think there are actually a lot of young families that I um, don't know in this church. So, uh, and we're a much smaller congregation than we were 25 years ago. Uh, and I think that's both for better and for worse. I think the congregation that we have um, is perhaps more uh spiritually connected to the, the, the ministry or the congregation as a whole, those that are, are active. But, um, you know, are we just comfortable with saying, you know, well, we need to attract more young families. Is it that continued, we're not big enough? Um, you know, do we need to shift our focus to, are we meeting the needs of the congregation um, that we have actively meeting. The other part uh, I think about uh, my, my feelings about the education component, Sydney really kind of nailed that on the head for me is um, are we meeting the educational needs that the congregation is is seeking and feeling tapped into when they're offered? Um, and if people are not participating, why are they not participating? Is it because um, this doesn't resonate? Is it because it was at um, an inconvenient time to participate? Is it um, because they didn't fully understand what was being, uh, what the objective of, of that education was? But most certainly, I was most tapped into the educational offerings for myself and my young children when I felt like there was um, development of spiritual journey and um, uh, gifts and talents. Um, then, um, oh gosh, the last part, Keith, can you throw that up on the screen just real quick so I can see it? Um, I'm sorry, everyone. The, uh, oh, yes, yes. So number four, okay, you can take it down. Um, the development of ministries, you know, we had this thing, it's been, already been mentioned in this discussion before, we had this entity called the, the Hope Center that really address that, uh, you know, and you think about um, Becky Morrison um, and, and her support groups, like we not only through that, and I don't know that we're large enough um, or have, I mean, the, the um, resources available to us anymore, but we did once offer that. And, and so I wonder when people express that, is it because that's something that we used to have when we had an abundance of re deep resources. Um, and now we kind of have to delegate or um, spend people off to community resources where they can get the uh, kind of personal um, uh, counseling or um, support, whether it's group or individual support that the Hope Center offered or the um, 
the educational component that uh, the Hope Center was able to, to organize and draw in, not just for our congregation, but for targeted um, communities within the uh, greater Salina community. Um, so like, that's, these are all old conversations or all, all old um, aspirations, in my opinion, Ewan. Um, and why do we feel like some of those haven't been met? And um, is it true that they're not being met or that they're just being addressed in, in different ways and uh, we haven't bought into that? That's, those are my too many words for that. I'll just put in one postscript to that too. During the time where the Family Hope Center and the grief support group were active and that seemed to bring in other work in providing health services for the community, that also did attract new people to our congregation, by the way. There was a growth there. Um, doesn't mean that we have to go back and do something like that, but where people gather together and work together and are and really spend time interpersonally with one another, it does make a difference, I think. And I don't think that size of congregation really is a huge piece of that, although we did have a staff person at the church who took care of the Hope Center. Uh, but Becky Morrison took care of the grief support group and the, and the congregation itself participated in setting up events for dental health and physical health. And uh, that helped us with membership. This is Maury, and I, I wonder, does this Holy Cow or whatever this organization is have a survey that would that is directed to the younger, just just the younger people in the church to get there? We don't have much input from them. I have a feeling. I have a feeling our input came from 60 years old and up. And I wonder if if we could go, you know, do just like they did here, email it to them and ask them to participate. Uh, you know, I, I suspect we're going to get a whole lot of different answers than what we see on the screen today is what's bothering me. And I think that's what the future is going to have to, to hold if, if we're going to go expect to have those people participate. It's a good idea. I think we have the numbers uh, on the age groups because that was part of filling out the survey. I know... Um, I know of some young people that participated in it, but we actually would have um, some concrete uh, awareness of just what type of uh, participation we had from younger points of view. Yeah, I have that here, uh, Maury. We only had uh, a couple people respond that were um, under the age of uh, 35. That's what I suspected. It yeah. sounds just like it. Yeah, we had 60, about 59%, 65 and over, 15%, 55 to 64, 16%, age 45 to 54, and 7%, 35 to 44, and then 2% below that. So, yeah, as, it, as we said last week, it definitely skewed to the older side. Uh, I don't know if Holy Cow has something that would ask different questions or ask the same questions, but, but uh, we certainly made the attempt to, uh, to reach our young And I'm not sure about that either. I just was looking at the Holy Cow website to see if there were any products geared towards age groups. I couldn't find that, but we can dig into that a little bit more deeply, uh, reaching out to Emily Swanson of Holy Cow. Well, I would have a question is how many of our members are in that category? I mean, how many, when we go out and we send that out, how many members are we gonna be thinking we're gonna get responses from? Um, 
I, I, I don't even know the answer to that question in our membership. <laughs> and if you put those younger percentages together, 35 to 45 and 45 to 55 and 55 to 65, it kind of evens it out, I think, in the responses. But I think your point about how many people do we have in that age group is a good question. Uh, I don't think probably on the responses to our holy cow that it, it was unrepresentative of our membership is what I'm trying to say. Um, in, our, in our annual report, we have uh, 153 members over 65, uh, but under 25 and under, we show um, 54 and 25 to, or 26 to 45, 46 and 56 to 65, 50. So, yeah, kind of a number. Mm -hmm. um, I know at one time they said that they didn't think the pandemic affected how the outcome of the holy cow was, but I think it affected it a lot. Maybe not our age group, but the younger ones, they weren't looking at that stuff. I mean, the, the, the family kids were, they were just trying to survive and they were not, they weren't taking the time to fill out these things. You know, it took like 20 to 30 minutes to fill it out. These parents were just trying to get through their day. And that was not a priority to them. And I think until we can open up to be, I, I don't think we got their, um, how they feel about things at all. I think this was a strictly a senior citizen, basically um, consensus. And I don't think that's just, that's just my feeling that I think a lot of these, Amy, you might be able to, say something but i just feel like a lot of them they 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 were on overload at the time and they did not i talked to several of them she says oh we didn't even see it you know they're just being inundated by all this and, and it was a low man on the totem pole and i don't think they did it so it would ha um you know once upon a time before we had this type of technology um at ready access or at a, before it had been invented, um, we would receive calls. So would that have been more of a accessible way for young families to be surveyed or interviewed? Or do you feel like people wouldn't have been as forthcoming if they're speaking to a member of the congregation about um, challenges? I, I, for me, even when I was one of the younger, um, uh, family leads, um, it was important to me. So I, I did. And, and I'm not saying like I was not under pandemic circ circumstances in there, but I definitely wanted something out of my church family for my um, children. And um, at that time, Deb and, and Dana were like really leading an engaged charge in trying to meet those needs in an educated uh, and informed way. So again, back to do, do we need to make personal connections to seek answers to those survey questions to these younger families that may have missed out or opted out or or weren't aware of the surveys um, in a timely manner. I don't know. I just what I heard they said they're just they were not interested in doing it. I mean, they just that was not a priority. And I think people are just getting disengaged. And until we can virtually get to back together again, I mean in person, I don't think we're gonna have a real good response. I think that's that's good comment. And hey, we've got about five more minutes uh, left. So if anybody else has any more questions, comments, discussion. 
Um, as a member of the communications committee, I am wondering what you would like to see in more communications, better communications, when you get communications, what, what you feel like you need to know but aren't getting now, what you'd like to know. Anything you could tell us would be helpful for us to be able to serve the church better. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna fill the space. Uh, Sydney, when we were young uh, in the pews or, or newer in the pews with our family, um, really the, the promotion and the awareness struck home for us when we heard it out of the lectern. Um, you know, whether it was you or Martha or Margie Hogarty, um, someone getting up there and letting us, you know, being the hype person for a new education opportunity that was coming up. Um, and, and we might hear that in a variety from a variety of vo voices, um, not just an announcement out of the pulpit, um, but um, that variety of congregational um, voice and hype um, was engaging <laughs> and it made you want to be a part of that. Um, so perhaps that's one element that we can find a way to reintegrate into our virtual um, experience is um, having, uh, you know, not just a minute for mission and those are important and we will be getting um, our, our mission partners and our people from the committee back in front of the congregation each Sunday or, you know, on Sundays um, more regularly, but particularly for our education and development opportunities, like we need to hear and see our people. I have a question. Um, one of the things that um, Brittany can track when she sends out the weekly announcements, the weekly word that goes out about noon on Friday is the open rate. In other words, they can see, um, they get statistics back to the office of if that email is opened. And it's only about a 36 to 40% open rate. Um, it had been increasing, but then it dropped, has kind of started dropping. Do you guys take time to read that? Who opens those? I mean, I do, but. I do. I do. I do, but not always in a timely manner and not because I don't, it's usually if I am, if I know, I already know I'm looking for information. And I would say part of that is because in a world of regular newsletters, um, once you've been exposed to an introductory um, uh, message time and time again, it doesn't um, register, at least for someone like me, like, uh, I'll, I'll get to this maybe on Saturday or Sunday, and then by Saturday or Sunday, what I thought I'd be looking for in that communication has already occurred, and so I might not open it for that week, um, but I do it with my college newsletter. I do it with um, a couple of the causes that I follow, um, and, and then of course the church, and then I get newsletters from the presbytery and also weekly prayer updates. So I'm like, it's, if I do open it up, sometimes it's to get that unread bubble off of my email. I know that sounds terrible. <laughs> no, that, that's a really good comment because we're interested in knowing that kind of thing. And what would um, cause someone to want to open it? And you alluded to um, changeability of it, if you knew that there was something more. Uh, one of the things um, that we kind of talked about, I'm thinking about is how can we stay better connected to each other? More newsy stuff about 
church members. Would something like that be of appeal or of interest if you knew that somebody, you know, if there was a illness in the family or you know, request for prayer or just other information like that? Yeah. I know other churches have prayer. My sisters belong, their churches, they have chains where if someone calls in for a prayer request, they have a chain of command that somebody calls somebody and the next one calls somebody and they let people know that way. I mean, I know when I was on deacons, I brought that up and I got struck down because they said because of HIPAA, we couldn't do that. But I, to me, if the person wants it, that gives them the okay to do that. And maybe something like that, if people want to sign up, volunteer for something like that. To, it's a more personal if you're calling someone or you could even text them and say, this is what's going on, send it on. I mean, to me, that is one way of doing something. All right, folks, we're gonna, I'm sorry, Amy, did you have a quick thing to say? Nope, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, I'm going to have to move on to our next Zoom here, but I know this conversation will continue next week as well. Um, Randy did, or Ewan, did you all have any closing thoughts? Nope. Uh, no closing thoughts, but appreciate it what I'm hearing. And uh, I'm going to probably have more questions in the next couple of days, Keith. Be prepared. <laughs> I'll be ready. I'll be ready. Ewan, would you uh, like to close us in prayer? I'd be happy to. Let us pray. In the coolness of this day, we are warmed by your spirit, O Lord, and by the fact that we can connect with one another through the technology made available to us. Therefore, I would like to ask that your spirit would touch each one gathered here that you would remind them of your living presence and remind us of the charge you've given to each of us, which may be unique and different, but it's always centered in Christ Jesus, your son. So with that in mind, we bid each other adieu until we meet again. For this we ask in Christ's name, amen. Amen. And goodbye, all. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you, Randy. You're welcome.